an original MCM production. Please remain standing as our member Janan Najib comes to the podium to present our invocation. Janan is the president of the Milwaukee Muslim Women's Coalition. Welcome, Janan. On the occasion of the 72nd anniversary of the founding of the United Nations, please join me in this prayer in the manner you feel comfortable. We pray for healing in our fractured world. We pray for compassionate and humble hearts, the strength to forgive, the patience to understand, and the inspiration to do what is right. We pray for the power of good to overcome evil and the power of love to overcome hate. We pray for a new world where fear shall no longer lead men to commit injustice, nor selfishness and ego make them bring suffering to others. We pray for the realization that we are children of different traditions, but we are inheritors of a shared wisdom and brethren of a common humanity. We pray that we can appreciate each other's values and gifts and uphold the dignity of every human being. We pray that we recognize our privilege and use it to become the voice of the voiceless the protectors of the hungry and the homeless, and the hope for those who live under fear and, and oppression. We pray for a meaningful life dedicated to the task of peace, justice, and harmony. We pray for peace in our world. Amen. Thank you, Janan. <clears throat> Now, for this very special program today, our 72nd anniversary of the United Nations, we have many guests joining us. First, I would like to thank especially my friend, our friend, Joan Robertson. She's the wife of the late Robbie Robertson, who was the president of our club in 1957 and 1958. Joan and her family created the A.D. Robertson Fund for the United Nations in 2004 to advance the understanding of the work of the United Nations and the role that Rotary has played with the United Nations since its founding. You will hear more about that shortly. We are also thrilled to have with us today the model UN team from Whitefish Bay High School, my alma mater, my kids' alma mater, Go Blue Dukes and members of the United Nations Association of Greater Milwaukee as well. We also want to give a special thanks to our member, Teresa Esser, for arranging for nine Korean entrepreneurs to join the Global Milwaukee Committee meeting this morning. Her guests are in Milwaukee to participate in the Midwest Energy Research Consortium Business Accelerator. Thank you, Teresa. And finally, we have many guests of our members and other visiting Rotarians in the crowd. So I am going to ask all of our visiting guests and Rotarians to please stand so that we can give you a warm Rotary welcome. We're so glad to have you here with us today. We always like to start our club business with at least one introduction of a new member. And today, I have the honors of doing just that. As, I, um, as my friend Jim Villa makes his way up to the stage, I need to warn everyone that he admittedly tends to steer clear of moments like this, where there's a microphone, bright lights, and a stage with people in front of him watching. He much rather prefers to be behind the scenes 
focused on getting results, looking for ways to bring people together, and hopefully strengthen our committee too. Jim's career would back all of that up, except for one small thing. He's not usually so behind the scenes. He tends to be right up front leading the way. He just pretends that he's not. Jim Villa is the CEO of Wisconsin's leading commercial real estate professional organization. NAOP, which started 50 years ago as the National Association of Industrial Parks and today is a commercial real estate development association that provides market education, research and content delivery, delivery networking opportunities, and advocacy too. Running a membership organization such as this requires a truly special leader. Someone with business experience, strong communication and leadership skills, and yes, political savvy. Jim Villa is exactly that person. Before taking on this role at NAOP more than a year ago, Jim served as the Vice President for University Relations for the entire University of Wisconsin system. Previously, he held the title of President and CEO of the Wisconsin, uh, I'm gonna mess this up, Commercial Association of, of Commercial Association of Realtors, sorry Jim. Um, he also spent some time working at Hewlett Packard, uh, and prior to that, many of us know him as the Chief of Staff to then County Executive Scott Walker, and prior to that, as Chief of Staff for State Senator Alberta Darling. He also serves on the Wisconsin State Fair Board and donates much of his time to committee work with various not-for-profits, especially the American Heart Association. Now, it has been so long that I don't exactly recall when Jim and I solidified our friendship. We both go back to Marquette University, where we both graduated. We were bright-eyed students, and we were certainly ready to change the world, and we went to work for people we believed would do it. We got involved in campaigns and public service, and we went on our merry ways. From this introduction, you all gathered that he went right, and I went left. <laughs> but. True to form, we have always, always found a way to meet somewhere in the middle. And now, he's a member of Rotary, where all of us gather, right here in the middle, to connect, in fellowship, focus on results, and of course, focus on making our community better. Please welcome Jim Villa. Thank you, thank you, Joanne, and thank you to all of you. It's an incredibly humbling experience to be a part of this organization, and I'm looking forward to getting to know all of you in the near future, uh, and, and certainly to enjoy t today's presentation. Thank you very much. That was fun. Okay, so um, last week we all had a little bit more fun too. We had our on the table conversation. Many of you were here and it was a luncheon that was in partnership with the Greater Milwaukee Foundation. It was focused on building new relationships, generating ideas and igniting action to benefit the future of our region. Please remember that we are continuing that conversa conversation with a digital table. Anyone that was here should have received a follow-up email um, the digital table was arranged by Kobe Skinord, the founder of Idea Wake. Hopefully you remember that he was here on September 19th presenting to us about crowdsourcing. So if you don't recall receiving that email, please just stop by the registration desk or notify the office. We'll get you another copy. The digital table will be open for one more week and we really welcome the chance to continue the conversation online. So please think about that when you leave Rotary today. Next, I'd like to call upon our member, Harry Drake from Key Benefit Concepts, who will now introduce our program. Thank you. Thank you, President Joanne. Um, before I introduce our extraordinary speaker, and I think you'll find that is the case in a little bit, let me tell you a little bit about the background on how this program came together. You've heard pieces of it, but let's begin at the beginning. It was made, the whole program was made possible through the A.D. Robertson Fund for the United Nations. That fund was created to celebrate UN Day. That was the day that the UN Charter was signed and the United Nations was launched. And that date, as Joanne already mentioned, was October 24th, 1945. 
exactly 72 years ago today. As Joanne mentioned, A.D. Robertson was a longtime member of Rotary and served as president of our club. Two of his interests we celebrate and hear and focus on today, the United Nations and Rotary. A.D. Robertson, or Robbie as so many knew him, represented the U is represented today by his widow, Joan, who is, we're very fortunate to have her today. Let me tell you a few things about Joan. She's a remarkable person. The Milwaukee Business Journal finally recognized Joan as a woman of influence last year. She's a lifelong advocate for women's rights and since 1945, I imagine, since the, for the UN. Whitefish, the Whitefish Bay students who are here today, the Whitefish Bay students who are participating in the Model UN program are here thanks to her generosity and the generosity of the Robertson family. Her support of the UN and its mission is alive and well at MPS. And on your table, you do have a description of the program that she is sponsoring along with her daughter, Annette. It's called the United Nations Schools of International Learning. Up and going now at 13, 14, 14 different, 13 <laughs> different MPS schools. Now, Rotary and UN have much in common. Both are international in membership and in scope. They support many of the same goals. For instance, the elimination of polio and the elimination of illiteracy. And for the promotion of clean water, sanitation, and rights and freedoms for all people. Rotarians helped out at the creation of the UN. 49 of the original 800 participants at the charter conference were Rotarians. And two of the charter members who signed the actual charter were Rotarians as well. At the 2016 International Rotary Convention held in Seoul, South Korea, Secretary General of the United States, outgoing Secretary General of the United States, I should say, Ban Ki-moon donated his honorarium, his speaker's honorarium, to Rotary's battle against polio. And he told the conference after he had done that, that Rotary represents the best the world has to offer. Now before I start talking about Steve, let me just point out that Rotary always thinks that of itself as a connector. And in fact, our latest brochure says we are a, um, an organization that connects people. And today, our speaker, Steve Radelet, was able to connect, connect with somebody that he first met when he was five years old, and also with our past president, who has a connection too. They had a nice long discussion about that connection. I'm sure there are probably others. Um, I think that what Steve Radelet has written so far and what we know about him represents the best that the world has to offer in his field. Steve is an economist, a scholar, advisor, and writer. Here are two, but here are two things I want you to know about him. He has Midwestern roots, having received his undergraduate degree at the University of Central Michigan. And as I heard today, he has siblings who live throughout the Midwest, including one, in, in Wisconsin and a couple in our uh, neighboring city to the south. <clears throat> On top of that, parents from Green Bay. Um, and another thing that I think you should know about is he served as a Peace Corps volunteer, not so amazing, but in Western Samoa and with his wife. As a scholar, he, he received his master's and his doctorate from Harvard, where he also taught as a professor at Georgetown. He now directs the Global Human Development Program. As advisor, he has counseled leaders of a number of developing countries. He served as chief economist to the US Agency for International Development and was, to, was advisor for development to Hillary Clinton when she served as Secretary of State. In addition, he served as in senior positions in many organizations. In addition to his scholarly articles, which are countless, he's produced, he's published four books, the most recent being The Great Scourge. And I think we did have a, uh, 
a photo of that on, on um, our screens. The, the subtitle of The Great Surge is The Ascent of the Developing World. This book tells of the rather recent progress made by millions of people in the developing nations in the most recent past, as well as the role that Rotary and the UN have played in that progress. Will you join me in welcoming our very extraordinary and multifaceted speaker today, Steve Radlett. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. Thank you, Harry, for that kind introduction. Thank you, Joanne, for welcoming me. Thank you to Mary, wherever you are, for organizing uh, this great event. Where is Mary? There's, oh, in the back, sorry. The light, you're right below the light, so I couldn't see you. Thank you for pulling this together. I'm delighted uh, to be here. Uh, as Harry mentioned, I have some Wisconsin roots. Both my parents are from Green Bay. My wife is from Appleton. Uh, I actually grew up in, uh, in East Lansing, uh, Michigan. Uh, five doors down from George Moore, my boyhood friend, who's uh, come over to visit me. I haven't seen George in years. And George and his wife, Cindy, have come out here to see me this afternoon. So it's, it's really great uh, to be here. I'm sorry that you're stuck uh, with an economist. Um, um, that's, that's your problem for lunch, uh, to be stuck on this great day with this great food and you get an economist for lunch. But I wanted to uh, start with a little story uh, to kind of put you at ease on that. Tell you a story about a man walking down a, a, a country road on a beautiful spring day. He's out in the middle of the pastures walking down a, a, a dirt road, a stone fence along the side, some trees, beautiful green pastures. And there's sheep and cows out in the meadows. And by and by, he comes along a man sitting under a tree. And they fall into conversation. Turns out the second man is a shepherd watching his sheep. So the man and the shepherd get talking for a while. After a while, the man says to the shepherd, I'm a betting man. And I wonder if you'll take a bet. I'll bet you $200 against one of your sheep that I can tell you exactly how many sheep you've got out in your pasture. And the shepherd thinks about that and says, that's an easy 200 bucks. Go ahead. The man looks around and looks behind the trees, out in the pasture, all around. He says, you have 223 sheep out there. And the shepherd is absolutely amazed. He's never seen anything like this before. He says, that's exactly right. You win. Take one of my sheep. So the man reaches over, grabs the nearest animal, throws it over his shoulder, turns and walks away. And the shepherd watches him for a few minutes and says, wait, wait a minute. Come back here. Come back here. Come back here. Double or nothing, I can tell you what you do for a profession. The man says, all right. I haven't told you anything. Go ahead. You're an economist. He says, you probably work for the federal government, but you're an economist for sure. He says, that's amazing. How did you know that? He says, put down my dog, and I'll tell you. <laughs> so we are we're pretty good at some things. We're not very good at other things. Um, but you're kind of stuck with me uh, today. But I'm, I'm, I'm really happy to be here, especially on, on both United Nations Day and Polio Day. Uh, both of which are celebrated uh, today. And of course, Rotary has something to do with the world fight against, uh, uh, against polio, and I'll come back to that later. But it is a, a day to celebrate progress in, in two big areas. Um, and I'll, I'll come to both of those, to the UN and, and to polio. But I want to start, what I want to do today is actually talk about a very big picture story about progress uh, in the world's poorest countries, things that are happening around the world right in front of our eyes that we we tend to miss. Um, we tend to focus on what goes wrong in the world and the bad news. If you read the newspapers every day, you can read about the famines going on in, in Yemen and in Sudan and in Nigeria. You can, you can read about conflict in Syria. You can read about dictators and failed elections. You can read about all the bad news. But what we don't focus on and what doesn't show up in the media very often is the very good news about long-term steady progress affecting not just millions, but billions of people around the world. Uh, and this progress that I want to tell you about has been happening over about 25 years, slowly in dozens of countries, uh, one of the leaders being South Korea, so I'm delighted that there's a, a delegation here from South Korea today, uh, but spreading around, around the world. Uh, and most people are unaware of it. In fact, most people believe that developing countries are stuck with no progress, stuck in deep poverty, uh, living under dictatorships, uh, with war and famine being commonplace. And that might have been true 30 or 40 years ago, but it's not anymore, actually quite the opposite. And that's what I want to tell you about. So I'm going to start with just a few slides showing some of the data on the progress that's been made since the early 1990s. Uh, then I want to talk a little bit about why that happened. Um, 
and how the UN played a role and how Rotary played a role. Uh, and then talk a little bit about the implications for the United States uh, in, in, in all of this. So let me start. I'm going to show you a couple slides. Uh, bear with me. You know, economists always have to have a little bit of data, but it's not too bad. Uh, and I'm going to look at some, some numbers here on global poverty, and then on progress on health, and progress on uh, education, progress on democracy, progress on conflict. Uh, so just a few snapshots of different dimensions of development. There's a lot more, uh, but uh, given our time constraints today, I can't show you everything, but I, I will show you uh, a few of these things. So the first chart actually goes back to 1820. This shows the number of people in the world living in absolute poverty, in abject poverty, uh, by this measure under $1 a day. This is the number of people whose incomes are under $1 a day. And this is a, a, a dollar uh, controlling for inflation over time, so this is in today's prices. And it shows that in 1820, 900 million people in the world were living under a dollar a day, in today's dollar a day. That's a pretty big number because in 1820, there were only one billion people in the world. 90% of the world's population in 1820 were living, in, in today's terms, under a dollar a day. The world was pretty bad 200 years ago uh, for most people. Um, uh, it was nasty, brutish, and short, as Thomas Hobbes uh, said in, in Leviathan. Uh, people uh, didn't ever go to school. They lived in very rudimentary housing. They were sick all the time, never saw a doctor, of course, never had electricity or anything to keep them warm other of fire. Children died young. Probably 40% of children died before the age of five. Um, uh, and, and people didn't live much longer than 40 or 50 years. Uh, there are a few exceptions if you happen to be related to a king or have big tracts of land, but for most people, Life was pretty, uh, was pretty miserable by today's standards. Uh, the number of people living in abject poverty continued to grow along with world population. Not as quickly as world population, but it continued to grow and grow and grow and grow um, up until the end of World War II. Actually, right there where that flattens out in 1945 happens to be the end of World War II and happens to be right when the United Nations was founded. And those are not completely coincidental. And starting from then, the number of, of, of global poor uh, stayed constant. It didn't rise, which is actually a, a big deal. No change was, was a big change because it stopped the rise that had been happening from the beginning of human history. But then, starting in the late 1980s, for the first time ever, the number of people living in extreme poverty began to fall. And it didn't fall a little. It fell a lot. It fell by more than one billion people in a matter of just two decades. Nothing like this has ever happened before in human history, and most people are totally unaware. I want to focus in on that last 30 years. These are more recent updated data with a slightly different poverty line, $1.90 a day. Uh, but this, again, is just counting the number of people whose incomes are below $1.90 a day. And you can see up till 1993, there were about 2 billion people living under $1.90 a day. The last data we have from 2015, that number is down to 700 million. That means that 1.3 billion people have been lifted out of extreme poverty around the world in just the last two decades. 1.3 billion. Now a lot of this is China. About half of this is China. It would actually be rather remarkable if a lot of this was not China. China's a pretty big country, and we all know it's been going through a rapid transformation. But it's not just China. This pattern of global poverty, of poverty rising, leveling off, and then falling has actually happened in about 60 countries around the world in the last two decades. It's in China, it's in India, it's in Bangladesh, it's in Indonesia, it's in South Korea, it's in Taiwan, it's in uh, Ethiopia, in South Africa, in Tanzania, in Ghana, in Senegal, in Brazil, in Chile, in Argentina, in Costa Rica, Dominican Republic, and on. Dozens of countries. This is not just a China phenomena. This is a global phenomenon. It's not happening everywhere, for sure. It is not happening in Sudan, or in Somalia, or the Central African Republic, or Cambodia, or a few other places uh, where this progress has not yet taken place, but it's happening in a lot of places. That's poverty. Let me switch to health. I mentioned that a couple hundred years ago, 40 percent of children didn't make it to age five. These are the more recent data. This shows the percentage of children who die before their fifth birthday in developing countries. In 1960, if you can believe it, 22% of children in developing countries died before their fifth birthday. More than one out of five, uh, mostly from, from things that could be prevented, from dirty water, from not being vaccinated, from not having medicines. One out of five. 
That number, 22%, is now down to 5% in 2013, which is still way too high and frankly unacceptable and unimaginable. It's one out of 20 children dying before the age of five. So we're not there yet by any stretch of the imagination. But this change, this drop from 22% of children dying before age five to 5% means that 17 out of every 100 kids today that are born would have died two generations ago, and now they're living. And they're living longer, and they're living healthier, and they're living lives with higher income, and they're going to school, and they're getting economic opportunities that their parents and grandparents did not have. Uh, this, I actually believe, is one of the most remarkable changes in world history. I think it's one of the greatest achievements of, of people around the world, that we have saved this, this many lives. And it's also a story about the best of people working together around the world. This happens because we've gotten vac vaccinations to kids. We've gotten vitamins out to kids. We've taught their mothers. A lot of this has to go, do with girls' education. This has to do with us connecting uh, drug companies like Merck that make the vaccines with the United Nations, with the USAID, with the best of what we do, working with governments in the other countries, working with local clinics, and working with the moms that bring their kids to the school. You've got to have all of those people working together for this to happen. Uh, and there are many debates about globalization, the good and the bad. This is the best of globalization, where people around the world have worked to make this happen. And I mentioned on the poverty numbers that it's not happening in every country. This is. The rate of child death has fallen since 1980 in every single country in the world, period. I'm not going to say except because there are no exceptions. The rate of infant death has fallen in the United States, it's fallen in Norway, it's fallen in the UK, it's fallen in South Africa, it's fallen in the Central African Republic, it has fallen in Somalia, it has fallen in Nigeria. Pick your worst case country and this has happened. This is really the best of people working together. So that's the health side. This is the education side. Just one slide on education that focuses on girls. This is the percentage of girls, the share of, 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 of young girls that actually complete primary school. Uh, and this number was down around 60% in the early 70s. We're now up to 90% of girls in developing countries uh, complete primary school. This is a really big deal. There are very few things that we can do in development that are more important than educating a girl. When we educate a girl, we have tons of research on this. When we educate a girl, those girls, when they become women, have more economic opportunities themselves. The research shows they get married later, they have fewer children. Those children are healthier. Those children are more likely to go to and complete school. And those children have higher incomes. There's an enormous intergenerational impact of just investing in a girl and creating those kinds of opportunities. And when people ask me whether I think this is going to continue into the future, this kind of global progress, this is why I think it will. Because we have already made progress in planting the seeds for the next generation by educating today's girls and giving them opportunities all around. So we're finally beginning to see more opportunities in education more broadly. The numbers are, are, are just as good for boys' education, but the girls uh, are, are uh, of special importance. This shows income. So I went from poverty to health to education. This is average income in developing countries of 109 countries around the world, where I have data back to 1960. And what you can see is incomes grew in developing countries from 1960 until the early 70s, and then they stopped growing from the mid-70s until the early 1990s, the mid-1990s. The average income in developing countries around the world, the average growth in incomes was zero. There was zero increase in the average income of people living in poor countries for 20 years. Those 20 years started with the oil crisis in the mid-1970s, and many of you will remember the global economic mess that, that came out of that, uh, and developing countries went into the debt crisis and went into their own deep recessions. They tended to be run by dictators. There was a lot of war and conflict in Central America, in Southeast Asia, of course, in Southern Africa around the end of apartheid. A lot of war, a lot of conflict, of course, in the Middle East as well, and there was very little development progress and almost no growth in incomes. But that ended in the early 1990s, uh, with the end of the Cold War, with greater global integration and, 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 and globalization, with the spread of technologies and other things which I'll come back to. But since 1995, average incomes in developing countries have doubled. The average income around the world, in the world's poorest countries, 
since 1995, excluding China, actually, excluding China, has doubled. In one generation, people today have twice the income of their parents. That's, again, a really big deal. That's income. Now I'm going to switch to, to, uh, to governance. Here's democracy. This is counting the number of countries, uh, developing countries, that are considered to be democracies. Now, there are lots of debates about how you define democracy, uh, for sure. This is not just uh, uh, you know, the president of some dictator someplace saying, I'm holding an election, and therefore I'm a democracy. Uh, this is based on various measures that political scientists have developed on, uh, uh, on, on care for human, to fight human rights abuses, free and fair elections, an independent uh, court, uh, and other measures of democracy. In the 1970s, there were only a few developing countries that were democracies, maybe a dozen. India, of course, was the, was the biggest democracy after, uh, after 1949. Um, uh, Costa Rica, uh, Botswana, and a few others. But most developing countries were run by pretty nasty dictators. But that again changed at the end of the Cold War. Where with the end of the Cold War, and the Cold War really was, a, was actually the final chapter, I think, of colonialization. Uh, colonial, most developing countries were under the thumb of colonialization for hundreds of years. And that began, began to change after World War II uh, and change even more rapidly in the 1960s. But we went into a Cold War situation where countries were forced to either line up with us or line up with the Soviet Union. And through that, we supported a lot of nasty dictators. We supported uh, uh, Marcos in the Philippines and the Duvaliers in Haiti and Mobutu in Congo and many others. And the Soviets supported the Derg in Ethiopia and lots of other pretty nasty regimes. But that ended. And for the first time, developing countries had the opportunity to choose their own leaders, to be free to pick their own elected leaders, to hold those people accountable, to uh, introduce more open economic systems that they could control. And we see this big spread to democracy. So those of you that have worked in Latin America, think about it. 30 years ago, basically every country in Latin America was a dictatorship from Chile under Pinochet, Argentina under the generals who invaded the Falkland Islands, all the way through Brazil, uh, up through Central America, uh, with the exception of Costa Rica. Basically, they were all dictatorships. Today, they're all democracies, all of them, except Venezuela and Cuba. The entire continent has shifted from dictatorship to democracy, right under our noses. Most of Asia, not all, but a lot of Asia has become a democracy. South Korea leading the way in its trans, uh, transformation to democracy in the early 1990s. Indonesia, where I lived for four years, used to be under Suharto for a long time and before, uh, before him dictators and colonialists before that. Indonesia is now a thriving democracy with elections last year where a furniture maker beat Suharto's son-in-law in an election. Never would have imagined it long ago. So democracy has spread around the world, but you can see on the tail it's beginning to falter. And that's a concern. I'll come back to that in a second. There are far fewer war wars. If you read the newspapers, the newspapers will tell you that there are conflicts all over the place and the world is going down the tubes. We live in the most peaceful time in human history, actually, and it's not even close. We live in the most peaceful time in human history in terms of counting the number of actual wars and conflicts going on. I don't want to diminish the horrible tragedy that's going on in Syria or what's going on in Yemen or in the Central African Republic or other places. But compared to where we were in the 1980s or certainly in the 1940s or the teens or any century before that, there are far fewer wars than ever before. Uh, if you're interested in that, you should read a book called The Better Angels of Our Nature by a guy named Steven Pinker at Harvard that documents violence around the world since 1500. But in the 1980s, all of Central America was at war. El Salvador, Guatemala, Nicaragua. Most of Southern Africa was in war in the last throes of apartheid. Of course, the Middle East, lots of conflicts. Israel and Egypt going to war with each other. In Asia, we had the remnants of the Vietnam War in Southeast Asia and Cambodia and everything that followed. Today in Asia, we have conflict in Afghanistan. We have conflict in Ukraine. And that is it in the great Asian landmass. In Latin America, with the signing of the Colombian peace deal a couple of years ago, uh, we have no active conflict in the Western Hemisphere. This is, these are unprecedented changes. Last slide. This goes back to income. I showed you this. In, I'm going to go back for a minute. This is the income slide that I showed you, the average income. That line right there is the middle line of this slide. And what I wanted to do here is just make the point that this progress that I'm talking about is not everywhere. That middle line is for all developing countries, their income. It looks flatter because the scale is bigger. 
The blue line on top of the 25 countries, developing countries that have grown the fastest, including South Korea. And their incomes have gone up by a factor of six in two generations. Today's citizens of South Korea and, and 25 other countries have incomes six times higher than their grandparents after controlling for inflation. But the line in the bottom, the gold line, shows the 25 countries with the slowest growth. And those developing countries, their incomes today are the same as they were 50 years ago in 1960. There's been no growth. And again, these are the disaster cases we hear about in Somalia and in Sudan and in the Central African Republic and many others. They're still there, but they are now the exception rather than the rule. And we live at this fascinating time where we've had some of the greatest progress ever, but juxtaposed against countries that are still stuck and not making any progress. And that is a challenge for all of us around the world. So how did this happen? Well, there are several big forces at work, one of which I've already alluded to, which was the end of the Cold War. There is no doubt in my mind that the end of the Cold War was really the fact that launched this, and as I said, finally gave people the opportunity to choose their own leaders and hold them accountable and to create more open economic systems with opportunities for everybody. And that really did change in the 1990s when people were unleashed from both colonialism and, and, and the Cold War. So those big geopolitics matter, and our leadership matters for bad or for good. Uh, uh, so that was one big force. The second, as I alluded to earlier, was globalization and integration. And there's lots of downsides and lots of upsides about globalization. But the fact is that countries that became more integrated to global trade and global financial systems were able to take advantage of these opportunities and lift themselves out of poverty. And those global connections include organizations like the United Nations. Uh, and organizations like the International Monetary Fund, the World Bank, NATO, uh, and, and others, where we work across borders and, 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 and with each other on these things. Technology was a big factor uh, uh, behind this as well, and the spread of not just cell phones, but the spread of electricity, and the spread of paved roads, and the spread of vaccines for kids, and malaria bed nets. Those are the technologies that matter uh, for the world's poorest people along with cell phones that connect people in the internet later. But that spread of technology again gave people uh, these kinds of opportunities. But the real factor was leadership around the world that focused on these issues and made them a priority. Leadership in developing countries, starting with Nelson Mandela, uh, Lech Walesa in Poland, Ellen Johnson Sirleaf in Liberia, who I work with, and great national political leaders. But it was also leaders of businesses, leaders of nonprofit organizations, church leaders like Desmond Tutu in South Africa, and local leaders that you've never heard of doing extraordinary things. And here, Rotary has something to say in the leadership in Rotary. Today we celebrate uh, Polio Day, and you know all better than I do on the fight against polio, but in the 1980s, there were still 1,000 cases of polio every day. 1,000 new cases a day. And in the late 1980s, polio started working on this and formed the, the uh, International Foundation in the, uh, 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 around that time. And since then has led the fight against polio with the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, with USAID, with the United Nations, and many others. And so, whereas in the 1980s we had 1,000 new cases a day, last year in 2016, around the world, in the whole year, there are 36 cases of polio. We're almost there, thanks to all of you, actually. And we're on the doorstep of eradicating polio. It'll become the second disease ever eradicated after smallpox. It now exists in just three countries, uh, and polio uh, is, is being fought vigorously by Rotary today. In fact, there's a, a, I, I, I saw that, that there's an online event in a couple of hours that Rotary is putting on with the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation to talk uh, about this. But it's leadership at the local level that all of you live and breathe every day, coupled with leadership at the national level and the international level that makes this happen. And part of this, I've talked a lot about global interconnectedness. And the United Nations epitomizes that and how it started 72 years ago. We didn't really even have countries until about 200 years ago. With the Treaty of Westphalia, we finally formalized the whole idea of national boundaries and countries which was a pretty new idea. But after World War II, uh, starting actually with the League of Nations, which didn't work uh, particularly well, uh, but after World War II and the mess of the two world wars and the, and, and, and the Great Depression, 
people around the world realized that we needed to work together to solve mutual problems, and we needed to cooperate across countries. It's an incredibly audacious idea, actually, that countries from around the world, whatever their politics, whatever their race, whatever their ethnicity, whatever their languages, could get together in a big room and talk about common problems and work to common solutions. Does it always work? Of course not. <laughs> I have trouble getting consensus with my own family, much less, much less the United Nations. Is it a big bureaucracy? Well, sometimes. Of course it is. Could it work better? Yeah, I can envision a lot of ways that it could work better. But there is no question in my mind that the world is a more peaceful and better off place and a more cooperative place because of the United Nations and because of the groups affiliated with it like the IMF and the World Bank and others. And that global cooperation that it epitomizes, I think, is one of the major forces uh, behind, uh, behind this great progress. This is also really important for the United States. And here I've been talking a little bit about a, as a global kind of citizen, if you will. But now I'm going to put on my hat uh, as an American who served my country as a Peace Corps volunteer. I've worked in the Treasury Department and for both Democratic and Republican administrations. I've worked in the State Department. I've worked at USAID. Um, and this, these changes in the world's poorest countries are incredibly important for the United States, for our own selfish interests. They're obviously important for people who live in these countries, but for our own selfish interests, these are really important for a couple of reasons. One, for our own security. Because countries that develop and get richer and have their own tax base and, have, and give their people opportunities don't tend to go to war. And we've had this massive decline in violence and where we still have violence happening and wars that affect us are countries where this great transformation has not really taken place. Bob Gates, who was the Secretary of Defense for both President Bush and President Obama, said frequently that it's a lot cheap, development is a lot cheaper than sending soldiers. And so from our own national security perspective, we need fewer Afghanistans and fewer Sudan, uh, Sudans where Osama bin Laden launched his attacks, uh, uh, his, his original organization. We need fewer countries like that and more that are, are developing. But it goes beyond that. Um, we need capable states around the world that will help us fight the problems that are important to us. We need to build states that have good health systems to fight pandemic diseases like HIV, AIDS, and Ebola that can affect us. And if we don't work on that, Ebola we kept at our borders, more or less. The next one we may not. But we need strong partners in other countries to fight diseases where they start. And if we're going to have strong partners, this becomes really important. We need them to fight drug trafficking and other transnational crimes. And we can't do it alone. Uh, but we need their cooperation. So there's that set of issues. There's a set of issues of markets. These are markets for our companies here in the United States. Developing countries uh, had about one-third of global trade 25 years ago. Now it's more than a half. These are the markets of the, uh, of the future so for so many of our products, whether it's airplanes or pharmaceutical products or medical supplies or, or uh, consumer products. Uh, there's that, uh, that dimension as well uh, for the United States. But the big thing, I think, is that these are countries that are trying to adopt the very values that the United States says that it holds dear. Openness, respect for other people, the ability to choose your leader and hold them accountable, open markets, opportunities for your children in school and in health. These are the very values that for a long time we have claimed as our own and we have said the rest of the world we would like them to follow in us. Many of the wars we fought were about those very principles. And here we have dozens of countries that are trying to emulate the United States, that want to share those values, and that can be partners for us in the decades to come to solve all kinds of problems from health to climate change to all of the other things that are going to affect us. And I believe it is deeply in our interest to help support this process and to help make it, uh, make it work even better. Uh, and we can help it through foreign aid, which has been a, a, an effective part of this story. We can help it through diplomatic relations and working with countries. We can help it by sitting down with people uh, who are different from us and finding areas of cooperation and areas where we can work together uh, for mutual gain. And if we do that, then this progress can continue. If we don't, I'm quite worried that it could all fall back, especially with new threats like climate change that really do, uh, really do affect these people, the people in the poorest countries, more than anyone else. So the opportunity is there for us to take or to not take, to work with developing countries around the world 
to help them to grow, to build their capacity to create new opportunities, that we can work for, with them to help us as well and to make a safer and more prosperous world for all of us. So let me stop there uh, and thank you very much for, for your kind attention. Thank you. I'm, I'm told it's now open for, for Q&A. So anyone who would like to speak, please stand up. Um, I'm gonna, you're going to have to speak loud because I'm getting old and my ears don't work so well. And I will repeat your question and we'll go from there. Great privilege to not be called an economist. Right? <laughs> 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 uh, tell us a little bit about uh, Puerto Rico. Mm. Uh, obviously, they're going through another traumatic event. But why did Puerto Rico get several billion dollars in debt? And I don't see them very strong as far as this developing strategy that you're talking about. Right. Very good. It's a good question. Of course, they're not in here because they're not a developing country. They're part of the United States. Um, so they're not in this data. But what happened um, uh, with Puerto Rico, without getting too much into the details, is that they were actually doing, they, so they weren't affected by these same, they were affected by uh, globalization and technology, but not so much by the end of the Cold War and some of these other major changes. Uh, and they were actually doing pretty well. Uh, in the uh, 90s, um, but um, at that point, they had some particular trade um, uh, uh, agreements with the United States, as part of the United States, where they had certain uh, privileges and tax benefits for companies from the 50 states, it's all the United States, so I have to word this, but com companies from the 50 states that would relocate in Puerto Rico got certain tax benefits. Those disappeared during the budget negotiations in the mid-1990s, and a lot of companies left. Uh, and the economy, Puerto Rico's economy, began to, to really slow down uh, in, uh, at that period of time. And at that point, they made what is, we can see in retrospect was a mistake uh, that they borrowed money to cover that gap. So as businesses left, their own tax base shrunk. Uh, and whenever that happens, a, a country, is a, a, a territory, is faced with what do you do? Do you cut your services or do you try to find a way to raise taxes? And so they raise deficits. Same way, frankly, we love to do it at the national government because we don't like to raise taxes and we don't like to cut services either. Um, uh, and so they ended up with a with a, a growing deficit. And then they really got hit after the 2008 financial crisis because even more investment left uh, and some of their uh, uh, reserves, they hold reserves uh, like any state or any uh, territory would, uh, bank accounts basically, and those got hit by the, the global financial crisis and so their deficit widened. So all this while they're borrowing more and more money. And no question about it, they borrowed more money always in the hopes that they were going to be able to attract new business. So they were in trouble already. And one of the issues for them as a, as a, because of their special legal status is that they don't actually fall into normal bankruptcy rules. So they're not a company, they're not a municipality, they're not a state, they're this thing, they're a territory. And bankruptcy law actually doesn't cover them. So Congress a couple of years ago had to introduce special legislation which gave limited ability for bankruptcy protection, but it was incomplete. So they were already entering into this period of, of some kind of quasi-bankruptcy uh, proceedings uh, because their debt, roughly the, the equivalent of municipal bonds, although they're not a municipality, uh, they weren't able to pay. And now all of a sudden we're hit by the, the hurricane. So they have no sound financial basis in order to, to recover uh, from that. Uh, and so that's the, the basic story. It's a, it's a terrible tragedy. Um, I don't know what's going to happen. Uh, if we do, uh, if, if we and the rest of the United States do nothing, there are going to be a lot of Puerto Ricans that move to the United States, move to Florida. Uh, I think that's going to happen anyway. Uh, but uh, it could be more or less, depending on what we do. And I think Congress is going to have to come up with some way to deal with the debt and essentially some kind of bailout, because especially now, they just, they just can't pay this debt. There's just no way they can pay this debt. And exactly how much the write-down should be is a matter of negotiations. And 
um, you know, if we want to support their, their future development, uh, there's going to have to be some inf in, uh, investment in infrastructure and other kind of things to, to rebuild. But it's a difficult, unusual situation because they are part of the United States in every way, except that they, uh, their votes don't count and they don't have members uh, representing them in, in, in Congress. Uh, but they are American citizens, um, uh, but they are an unusual entity, so Congress is going to have to figure out how to deal with them. Thank you. Yes. Thanks for the great speech and the excellent research on the statistics. I wonder, as far as the end of the Cold War, sometimes I think it's different than the, the foreign policy establishment. There's still somebody that has a vested interest in keeping that Cold War going. So they expand NATO geographically, they expand its mission, uh, they won't let relations with Cuba recover to where they once were, despite the Cold War seeming to have been over. Um, and it seemed like the continuum, whether it was Democrats or Republicans in power, um, how strong is that? Is it strengthening or weakening? What did we do to really bring an end to the Cold War? Yeah, it's a good question. So the question, just for uh, the recording, uh, was about whether the Cold War has really ended, uh, and in some people's minds it hasn't because we continue uh, to not have uh, the best of relationships with Cuba, NATO has been expanding, uh, and other kinds of things. So the expansion of NATO was in part because of, of continuing concern about Russia, uh, but in part also as, as uh, the countries in Eastern Europe became independent, it was a way to actually bring them into the fold. So, and those are related to each other, but it was a way to kind of bring those countries into, into, uh, you know, into the tent, if you will. Um, uh, but it did, it did reflect that we had never quite trusted uh, Russia. Uh, and, and that, of course, carried over to Cuba as well. Uh, that's accelerating now because I think it's pretty clear in the last few years that the animosity has grown uh, on, on both sides and, and, uh, and Putin has taken a, 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 a much stronger stance um, and is clearly trying to reassert um, uh, Russia's position on the world stage. Um, and I think a lot of people, whether they're in the foreign policy establishment or not, are pretty nervous about that and where it might lead. And of course, we saw that play out with the annexation of Crimea a couple of years ago, um, where it's really one of the only times in the last 20 years where someone has actually made a territorial grab. Territorial grabs used to be pretty common, but they stopped. And all of a sudden, Russia made a territorial grab. So there's a lot of concern about, um, about what their aspirations are and, and what they want to do on a, on a, on a global uh, on a global stage. Um, and, you know, another element of that is actually, you know, climate change, there's going to be a lot of winners and losers. Russia may be a winner because some of those lands up north are going to thaw, and there's a lot of work showing that they actually might have more agricultural, uh, more productive agricultural lands. So there is a, a, a big growing concern about, about Russia. And meanwhile, of course, we've got the growth of China uh, as well. Uh, who I actually believe in the long run can be a, a pretty good partner of ours. We have a lot of differences, but we have a lot of mutual, um, uh, 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 mutual issues that we can work on uh, together. Um, and I think that's shown itself. Uh, so we have really kind of a, a three-way relationship here where Russia is now the, the distant third but, but growing in its, in, in its muscles. Um, so I think, uh, you know, that this is going to be a big issue for the years to come, but we're going to need international organizations like the United Nations and others to help work out these relationships across countries and to bring countries together that we can work with Cuba and or Russia and China and whatever it is, again, to mutual gain. It's exactly for those reasons that I don't think we can go it alone, that we're going to need a larger infrastructure, uh, an organization, and countries around the world that are uh, allied uh, uh, with us. Um, uh, I don't see too many countries that want to uh, ally themselves with the, with the Russians at this moment. There are more and more that want to ally themselves with China, uh, especially in the last uh, year um, or so. And, and, and so there's a, so it's not exactly the Cold War, but it does have some of those same implications. It's a good question. I'm looking for you, of course. Thank you, uh, Mrs. Robertson, and thanks for all of your work uh, 
to make uh, the United Nations stronger. And the question was whether I got get a chance to work with Ambassador Haley or Secretary Tillerson at all. Um, uh, given that I was a senior advisor to Hillary Clinton, um, I'm not exactly embraced um, by this administration. I also worked for the Bush administration. I worked for uh, Secretary of, of the Treasury, Paul O'Neill, when he was uh, George Bush's um, uh, Treasury Secretary. So I, I, I do have a little bit of bipartisan bona fides, but the fact that I was doing exactly what you're talking about, but with the last administration, um, it makes me a little bit of a persona non grata with this administration. I have met Secretary Tillerson, but just very briefly, I have not met Sec uh, Ambassador uh, Haley. Um, but uh, uh, you know, I would welcome the opportunity, but I'm 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 not confident that that opportunity is going to arise. <laughs> but thank you. All right. Thank you all very much. production.